Spectrum is, as many of you know, a software tool that allows you to organize, optimize, and share your digital photos. In other words, it covers essentially, in theory at least, your entire workflow when it comes to organizing and optimizing and potentially even sharing your photos in a variety of different ways. And we're going to focus on the develop module, but one of the things that I like about Lightroom is that I'm able to switch back and forth between the various modules. So I can go into the library module, for example, to assign star ratings and keywords to my images and work to find my favorite images. And then those favorites are the ones that I'm most likely going to want to work with in the develop module. One of the best advantages of working with Lightroom in the context of your photos is that everything you do in the develop module is non-destructive. You cannot harm a pixel in Lightroom's develop module no matter how hard you try because every single adjustment you apply is really just metadata. We're not changing the underlying pixel values. We're simply applying metadata. Metadata in the form of exposure information, for example. Metadata saying brighten the image by 3.6 stops. I don't know why you would ever want to do that, but you could. Or darken the image by 2.9 stops. Those are just metadata values. I haven't changed any of the actual information in my original capture, in this case, in an original raw capture. I'm able to work with my raw files, my TIFF images, my JPEG images. If there's an image that is basically supported by a camera, an image that you would likely use in your workflow, it's probably already supported by Lightroom's develop module. Obviously, camera companies are coming up with new raw formats all the time. And but the Adobe team stays very busy trying to keep up with that so that Lightroom supports all of those latest formats. Now, when it comes to the overall interface, you've already seen I've gone to the library module and the develop module. Up at the top, we have the top panel, which we generally refer to as the module picker because we get to pick among the various modules. We'll focus on the develop module today. And then down at the bottom of the display, I have my bottom panel or the film strip. And this is a persistent view of the currently available images. So this might be the images in, a, in the current folder, images based on a filter. So for example, only show me my images with the highest star ratings or a particular keyword, etc. And so I can switch among the various images that are currently available down on that film strip. And then over on the left panel, we have what I think of as kind of the bigger decisions in some respects. We have the navigator so we can see an idea of which portion of the image we're looking at and zoom in and out. We also have some presets, and we'll talk about those shortly. And then I've got snapshots in history. We'll talk just a little bit about history today and then collections. So these are bigger issues, the more broad workflow concepts. And then over on the right panel, I have my various adjustments. I'll hide the histogram just so we can see more of those adjustments. And we have a wide variety of adjustments available. Now, all of these adjustments, once again, are non-destructive. And for all of these adjustments, it really doesn't actually matter what order you apply the adjustments in. Now, there are some potential performance issues. For example, if I apply a dehaze adjustment early in my workflow, that's going to cause Lightroom to work a little bit harder to update the preview when I'm applying other adjustments. But in terms of the final result for your photo, it really doesn't matter what order you're applying those adjustments in. And so you can work in whatever order makes the most sense to you. Generally speaking, I recommend having a little bit of an orderly approach to that workflow. And we'll talk about that shortly. I also want to address presets. Now, the presets we'll find over on the left panel in the library module. And those presets, all they are really doing is saving settings from the right panel. So if I have a sepia with a strong vignette preset, you can see that that has created, obviously, an effect in the image. But really, all that I've done is automated the process, automated the process of assigning a variety of adjustments over on the right panel. So in this case, for example, a sepia effect, that was done with the split toning. So I can, I can see the split toning values there. There's a vignette applied. There's probably some additional adjustments. Obviously, it was converted to black and white. So I have black and white as the treatment option versus color. But again, all of the settings that were applied by that preset are just save settings. There is nothing that you can do with the preset in Lightroom that you cannot do over on the right panel. So the preset is just a nice shortcut. It's a way to quickly get to the particular adjustment that you want for an image. 
So, for example, you can see I have some lens correction presets here. I have a basic infrared effect here. I have I've some noise reduction. Just so I have some <laughs> basic presets that are applied. Or specific effects to the image. State. Generally speaking, I would say that presets should be thought of as a good starting point and to help streamline your workflow. In other words, if I like a sepia tone effect with a vignette, I'm not very likely to want to assign the exact same settings to every single image. And so I would always think of a preset just as a basic starting point or as a convenience tool in my workflow. If I do find settings that I like, let's just change this all together just so that we can see an illustrative example. Let's make it a cyanotype of some sort. Then I can choose to update various settings. I've just made changes over on the right panel. If I decide, hey, this is something that I kind of like, I can create a new preset to preserve those settings so I can easily assign those settings to a different image. So I'll go ahead and click the plus icon associated with the presets header, and we'll just call this Tim's Cyanotype, for example. I can choose which specific adjustments I want to include as part of this preset. So if I wanted to mix and match or only include a vignette effect, or in this case, including just about everything, I'll go ahead and apply the automatic black and white mix, for example, and then I'll create that preset. And you can see, in this case, I've put it in a different folder than I might have otherwise wanted to. Down below, I'll move that preset into a different location. So now if I go to a different image, I can apply that preset with the click of the mouse button. And in this case, not exactly producing an effect you might want for this particular photo, but again, demonstrating that concept of being able to just save various settings for your adjustments. So something that's worth keeping in mind in terms of using presets to sort of streamline your workflow just a little bit. Now, I also want to talk about some of the broader workflow issues, and in particular, the undo and reset. Now, hypothetically speaking, somewhere along the way, you're going to make a mistake when you're applying an adjustment to an image, or perhaps more likely, you're going to realize that you don't care for a particular effect, so you want to kind of back out from that effect. So let me just show you a few of the various ways that we can make changes to our images in the way of undoing certain tasks. So there are a variety of things here that we can do. First off, let's take a look at the history. I'm sure most of us are very familiar. It's almost become a, a cult icon. The Control Z or Command Z keyboard shut, shortcut, the undo command in Photoshop and other applications, including Lightroom. We have that same capability here. So I can press Control Z or Command Z to undo the most recently made change. And I can also go back on the history panel. So on the left panel in the develop module, I have the history and I can go back in time, essentially. It's linear. I can't pick and choose which things I want to undo, but I can go back to a previous history state. So each time I make a change to an image that is preserved as a history state, in this case, you can see that a preset was applied called Tim Cyanotype. If I don't want that effect applied, I can just go back in time to a previous history state, click on that history state, and that will take me back to whatever condition existed at that time. So in this case, I go all the way back to the original version of the image as it was imported. In addition, as I'm applying various effects in the image, I have ways of undoing or you know, fixing various problems. So if I take the oranges and you know make them look a little bit silly, maybe take those yellows and the greens toward all sorts of wild variations on the colors that originally existed in this image, I have several options for undoing that. I can turn off a section of adjustments. So as we'll see shortly, we have various sections of the adjustments over on the right panel. I can turn off or on. It's kind of like a light switch individual sections. So in this case, the HSL or hue, saturation, and luminance values, I can turn those off or on altogether. I can also reset individual controls. So for example, if I decide that red hue shift was maybe not such a good idea, I can double click on the slider handle and that will reset that specific slider. If I want to perform a bigger reset back to default values, I can hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh, and you'll notice that my little headings here, Hue and Saturation, for example, have changed to include the word Reset. So while I'm holding the Alt or Option key, I can click on that text 
and reset those various controls. So in this case, the hue controls. And then I also have the ability to reset the overall image. So for example, if I've made a lot of changes and I'm just not happy with the result that I'm getting, I can click the reset button down at the bottom of the right panel and that will take my image back to its original settings, the default settings in terms of interpreting that photo. So we come into an image and we decide we need to make some changes and then the question is, what do we do? How do I even get started? Well, I'm gonna get started by hiding the left panel and the top panel just to give us a little bit more room for the image itself. And then I'll consider my overall workflow for the image. Now notice that my workflow in some respects is almost defined by Lightroom, at least in theory. As I mentioned, I have all of these various sections within the right panel. So I have the basic set of adjustments as one section, then the tone curve, and then HSL color in black and white, and then we have split toning, etc. I can collapse any of those. So if there's some of these that I just tend not to use very often, so for example, I don't tend to use camera calibration much at all, I can click on that header to collapse. If you find that this right panel is a little bit overwhelming, especially as you're just getting started in Lightroom, then you might consider what's called solo mode. So I can collapse individual sections. I can also configure Lightroom so that only one section of this panel is visible at any given time. I'll go ahead and right click on one of these headers and choose solo mode. And now only one section of the right panel will be open at any given time. So if I open up the split toning section, for example, then the basic section that had been open closes up. So for some users, that can be a little bit easier to work with. I find it a little distracting when things bounce around, so I prefer not to have that solo mode enabled. And in fact, I just like to expand all of those sections. Now that I've gotten familiar with the various adjustments, I just find it easier, well, maybe not easier, but more comfortable to just have everything available all at once. So the way I think about my adjustments for the image are by and large, to think about the priority as it were. What's the most important change? Now, as a general rule, I always start off with the basic set of adjustments. In most cases, every single image needs at least a little bit of work in these basic set of adjustments. Even when I think I got it perfect in the camera, there's always a little bit of fine tuning that I like to do. So I'll generally start with the basic section because those are my most basic adjustments. And then I'll consider what other adjustments might be necessary. And I don't tend to use the tone curve too much because, quite frankly, the basic set of adjustments gives me the control I need for most images in that regard. HSL would be something of a special case depending on the particular image or if I want to create a black and white interpretation, which we'll take a look at. Split tone, I don't use very much. Detail sharpening and noise reduction, those certainly can be important. Noise reduction in particular can be very important for an image. Lens corrections and transform, that's a new option, a new section which has been created essentially to allow for the guided uprights. So the upright controls kept getting more and more sophisticated. Now they have their own section in the way of transform. And then I have some special effects, you might say, in camera calibration. So generally I'm starting at the top and working my way down but a lot of what I need for an image can be accomplished with the basic section. So let's start off with the tonal adjustments and the approach that I prefer to take and that I recommend when it comes to those tonal adjustments. First and foremost, in the tone section here, the basic set of adjustments, I have exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. Exposure is a control that I will use if the overall image looks to have been not so good in the exposure department. So I need a fix for the overall exposure. And so if I go to the hit, in this case, for example, you can see that I haven't clipped any shadow detail, but it's definitely, this image is definitely shifted over toward the left, toward a darker exposure than I should have had. And so I want to correct for that. Now, the exposure adjustment is not one that I'll use for every single image. In fact, it's one that I use a very small percentage of the time because, not because I'm good as a photographer, but because my camera's pretty good when it comes to metering. And so generally speaking, the exposure out of the camera is pretty close. Keep in mind that I have other tonal adjustment options available here, the whites, blacks, highlights, and shadows. And so I only want to use the exposure if I need the exposure. And generally speaking, I find 
if there is a need for an exposure adjustment, I only need about maybe a half stop adjustment at most, in most cases. And the value here that we see, the numeric value for exposure, actually is an exposure value. It is stops of light. Now, there is the clipping preview. We'll talk about clipping preview shortly. I can look at the histogram, but honestly, when it comes to exposure, I don't worry about that too terribly much because I'm still going to adjust overall luminance values for my photo, overall tonal adjustment values with my other sliders, whites, blacks, highlights, and shadows. So generally speaking, even though there is a clipping preview option available for exposure, I generally just eyeball it. Keep in mind, that I'm eyeballing it after having calibrated my monitor display so that I know that I have an accurate presentation of my image. So I'll just eyeball, I could certainly reference the histogram, but then the real work begins, and that is to fine tune the overall tonality and the overall level of detail. So I'm essentially adjusting overall contrast, my overall dynamic range, and then the degree to which detail is visible in the bright versus dark areas of the photo. And by extension, at that point, I'm also defining overall contrast for the image. So let's take a look. Adobe has decided that these sliders belong in a particular order, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. I prefer to go in a different order. I start with whites, then go to blacks. Those two are going to establish my overall dynamic range, the overall tonal range for the image. Generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, if I have an image that I've captured outdoors in particular, but really for me personally, in most cases, I want the brightest pixel in my image to be right about white and the darkest pixel to be right about black. And I want to cover all those zones in between as it were, for those of you familiar with the zone system, same basic concept. I generally want to spread out my histogram essentially. And so I'm going to use the whites and the blacks sliders for that to maximize dynamic range or tonal range for the image itself. So I'll go ahead and hold the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh, so that I can get the clipping preview that shows me where I'm losing detail because I don't want to lose detail. So if I hold the Alt or Option key and drag the whites slider over toward the right, eventually I'll see an indication that there is clipping. Color indicates that one or two channels have started to lose detail. White indicates that all three channels have lost detail. I've blown out the highlights. I've lost detail in the brightest areas of the image. Now, looking at the full preview of the image, I guess we didn't really need the clipping preview to know that increasing the white's value so much was going to cause a loss of detail. But more importantly, by holding that Alt or Option key and adjusting my white point, I can drag to the right until I start to see clipping. And then I can move back to the left just to the point where I no longer see any clipping. In other words, making the whites as bright as possible without losing any information in the process. We'll talk more about that detail, that information, in just a moment. But first, let's go on to the blacks slider to set that opposite end of the tonal spectrum, the darkest value in the image, once again, holding the Alt or Option key, and then dragging the black slider over toward the left to see where I'm losing detail, and then back to the right until those pixels, for the most part, completely disappear or almost completely disappear. With the blacks, you have a little bit more leeway because we don't expect to see a lot of detail in the shadows necessarily, so you could probably get away with a little bit of a different adjustment there. You might clip just a tiny little bit for those black values, for example. But again, what we've accomplished here is to expand the dynamic range of the image. And I'll show you an example in a moment that demonstrates that we don't necessarily want to do that for every image, but I would say most images, that's certainly the case. I should add, by the way, if you have questions along the way during today's webinar, please be sure to type those into the GoToWebinar window there, the, the questions section. Renee is standing by and fielding any questions you may have, and she'll let me know when we have some questions from attendees so that we can address those along the way. So in this case, I've established the blacks and the whites, the brightest and darkest values for the image. Now let's focus on detail. Now, I could prove to you mathematically, if I were so inclined, that I have absolutely, positively not lost any highlight detail in this photo because I looked at that clipping preview for whites, and so I know for a fact that none of that detail has been lost. 
except it's not about scientific proof, mathematical proof in photography, is it? It's about how good that print looks hanging on the wall. And if I zoom in on the head of the eagle here, you can see that while I didn't clip any highlight detail, I'm not really seeing a whole lot of those highlights. And so I want to darken the highlights to bring out a little bit more of that detail. Now the beauty of highlights, I can brighten my highlights or darken the highlights. But when I darken the highlights, not only am I toning down the brightness of the brightest areas in the photo, but I'm also adding a little bit of contrast. If you're already familiar with the clarity adjustment, a negative value for highlights is not only darkening the highlights, it's essentially adding a little touch of clarity at the same time. And that can be tremendously helpful for an image. So then taking a look at shadows. So I've darkened down those highlights just enough to bring out some of that detail to accentuate the detail in the brightest areas of the photo. And now I'm going to take a look at my shadow detail. Do I want to darken up the shadows and kind of add a sense of drama or contrast to the scene? Or do I want to brighten up those shadows so that you can see every little bit of nook and cranny, every nook and cranny in those shadows will be visible, like a big fill flash effect, essentially. Now, this varies based on the image itself, but also based on your preferences as a photographer. Now, when it comes to nature photography, I'm a little bit more inclined to reveal more detail, to show every bit of feather detail for this bald eagle, for example. But for a lot of my other photography, travel photography, I have a tendency to like a little bit of drama, a little more impact in the image. So in many cases, I'll actually darken those shadows to increase contrast for the image. In other situations, I might want to open up those shadows just a little bit. When I brighten the shadows, you can probably appreciate that there's a risk that we will create a little muddiness, a lack of contrast in those shadows. But rest assured, just like with highlights, when we darken the highlights, we get a little bump in contrast. When we brighten the shadows, we also get that little bump in contrast. Again, very similar to a clarity adjustment. Now, you might have noticed that I skipped the contrast slider altogether, and that is true the vast majority of the time. I almost never adjust the contrast slider in my image. It's not that I don't want to affect contrast, it's that I don't need the contrast slider for it because I'm using highlights and shadows to impact overall contrast. I've established my white point, my black point, that certainly can help with contrast, and then I'm lightening or darkening individually the shadows and the highlights in order to bring out the amount of detail that I want and my direct relationship to that essentially to affect contrast in the image as well. So generally speaking, I'll leave that contrast slider alone because I've already accomplished my goals for contrast with those other adjustments. Now we could also use the tone curve. I don't tend to use the tone curve very much. You see we have highlights, lights, darks, and shadows, so we can affect individual ranges of tonality. But again, I've got a little bit more sophisticated control with my highlights and shadows adjustments in particular. And so I tend not to use those adjustments. Note that I can switch to an actual point curve. So instead of using those parameters, I can define individual anchor points that I want to use to optimize the appearance of the image, very similar to the curves adjustment that's available in Photoshop. Of course, in this case, not the best adjustment at all. I'm just playing around with some anchor points on the curve. So I'll set that back to linear to disable the tone curve altogether, make it just a non-curvy curve, a straight line that has no impact on the image. Now I mentioned that I will almost always adjust the whites and the blacks using the clipping preview and then I'll fine tune with highlights and shadows. Almost always, but not always. I'm going to go to another image here, an example of a situation where I would not use that same approach for setting the white point and the black point. Let's take a look at why. I'll once again hold the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh, and then increase the value for whites until I start to see some clipping. I'll then back off to the point where that clipping just barely disappears. We'll do the same for the black point. And right there, I start to see some pixels for the black point and I've essentially ruined the image. So I went from this very kind of dreary, foggy, almost ethereal looking scene to this really kind of over-contrasty and inky, blotchy, weird looking mess. 
And so bear in mind that I don't always want the brightest pixel in the image to be white. I don't always want the darkest pixel in the image to be black. I might want to boost the colors or I might want to tone down the shadows just a little bit to make the space needle in this case stand out a little bit better. I might want to brighten that overall exposure just a tiny little bit. There are some things that I might do to the image, but I don't always want to take advantage of that clipping preview. So just bear in mind that the clipping preview is a good tool as a general tool for trying to optimize the overall tonal range in the image. It's incredibly helpful for maximizing the contrast in the image, for maximizing dynamic range in the image, for setting a white point and a black point, but it's not right for every single image. So just be aware of that and kind of do that sanity check essentially to make sure that whatever adjustments you're applying make sense for the image that you're currently working on. Now, once I've established those overall settings for tonality, the blacks, whites, highlights, and shadows, then I'm ready to move on to the color in the image. And fortunately, today's digital cameras actually do a pretty good job of getting the color pretty close to accurate in most cases, in many cases, right in the camera itself. Now, with raw captures, bear in mind that we have complete flexibility for adjusting the color temperature after the capture. The color temperature, the temperature and tint sliders, the white balance setting, that is just a metadata value. It does not affect the actual data included in your raw capture insofar as pixel values are concerned. So you can fine tune as needed after the fact when processing in Lightroom with no penalty in terms of overall image quality. Of course, you might have a workflow advantage to getting things as close to perfect as possible in the camera, but you do have some flexibility when it comes to color. And there are several options that you can use when it comes to actually adjusting the color within Lightroom. So first off, we can choose a white balance preset. So I can say, just give me the color the way it came out of the camera, or I remember that it was fluorescent lighting under those circumstances, or that I fired the flash, or whatever the case might be, I can choose a different preset. These essentially mimic the presets in your camera but keep in mind that auto, when it comes to Lightroom, is not the same as auto in your camera as far as that white balance setting. Auto means Lightroom is going to try to figure out what the color ought to look like. In this case, it doesn't do a very good job at all. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. We also have an eyedropper, so I can click on that eyedropper and then go click in an area of the image that I think should be perfectly neutral, and the image will be adjusted to make that area look neutral. Sometimes this works reasonably well, but what I find is that I'm usually click, click, clicking around in the image trying to find the right spot to click on. And regardless, if I've used a white balance preset or if I've used that eyedropper, I still want to fine tune things with the temperature and tint sliders. So my personal approach, my personal preference is to just go directly to those sliders. In this case, the image came out way too yellow. Yes, this was, well, you could say late afternoon. This was right after sunset shortly after sunset, during blue hour. So there may have been a little bit of yellow left in the sky, but this image really looks much too yellow, especially if we look at the Space Needle in particular. And so I'm just going to take that slider over toward the left to cool things off and make the image more blue. Now I hear from a lot of photographers, they don't think that they have a good eye for color. One tip for that, swing these sliders through the extremes. You'll go from this absurd looking kind of moonlit night effect to this I've never seen golden hour quite like that type of effect. But then in between, you'll start to get a sense of what is accurate color. And I would say somewhere right about there looks pretty good to my eye. I can also then come to the tint control, magenta versus green. Generally, this is going to be a much more subtle adjustment because we don't want magenta or green typically in our photos as far as the color cast is concerned. We might want to warm things up toward yellow or cool things down toward blue, but it's not that often that we want to shift toward green versus magenta. So that's usually just corrective. Now, if you're having a difficult time getting those sliders or any of the sliders in Lightroom into the right position, here's a really handy tip for any slider control. I can obviously use the mouse and drag left and right to adjust that slider position. But then once I'm pretty close to where I think I want that slider to be, every slider has a numeric value over to the right associated with it. I'll click into that numeric value. You'll see that it gets highlighted, indicating that it is active. And now I can use the up 
and down arrow keys on the keyboard to increase or decrease the value for that slider. If I add the shift key, then in most cases, I'll get about a tenfold increase in that effect. It'll vary with some of the sliders, including temperature, but I can use shift up arrow to increase in big increments, shift down arrow to decrease in large increments, and then once I'm pretty close to where I think I wanna be, I can fine tune by letting go of the shift key and then just pressing the up and down arrow keys as needed to fine tune the overall effect. So that can be tremendously helpful. Once again, we're evaluating in this case color based on what you're seeing on your display. It is critically important therefore that your display is accurate. So again, not to reinforce too many times, but I think it's critically important. A lot of photographers seem to have forgotten about the importance of calibrating your display. And so I would say that that is something that is critically, critically important. All right, so moving on to some of my favorite adjustments, the color controls, the presence controls, vibrance and saturation, as well as clarity. So let's take a look at vibrance and saturation first. I think we're all familiar with saturation. So I'll increase the value for saturation and we get more vibrant colors, more saturated colors, essentially more pure colors, closer to the primary colors, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow. And I can decrease saturation and I'm losing that color intensity, well, potentially going all the way down to a black and white interpretation of the image. This is not how I would create a black and white interpretation but this is a way that we can adjust overall saturation. But that's a very linear type of saturation adjustment. I'm essentially boosting all of the colors or toning down all of the colors in a, for the most part, equal way. Vibrance gives me a much, in many cases, more pleasing result because it has a variable effect on the image. The vibrance exercises self-control in a couple of different ways. Number one, Vibrance will protect skin tones. So if you've got a portrait, if you photograph people on a regular basis, vibrance is your best friend. It will boost the colors in your image, but it will minimize that boost, that saturation increase for colors that are found in the typical ranges of skin tones. So that can be tremendously helpful. But it also has a variable effect on colors in general. And the way that works is the colors that are not very saturated get a stronger boost than the colors that are already saturated. In this case, the airplane, pretty saturated in terms of those yellows. The sky, not very saturated at all. As I increase the value for vibrance, the sky gets a stronger boost than the airplane does. The blues up in the sky, cyan and blue values up in the sky, are getting a stronger boost than the yellows in the airplane. Essentially what's happening here is I'm equalizing saturation. I'm pushing up saturation of the colors that need it the most so that they're much closer to the overall saturation for the colors that were already pretty well saturated. And what that also translates into is that I can push vibrance pretty far without creating a super artificial appearance in the colors of the image. Now I've got that vibrance kicked up pretty high. It is looking a little overdone, but that sort of felt necessary because I needed to bring the sky up much closer in saturation to the yellows of the airplane. So I feel that I've comfortably equalized out those colors, except now the overall saturation for the photo is a bit too high. What to do about that? Well, it's very simple. Remember, saturation is a more linear adjustment, so I can boost the vibrance value, sometimes to a very high degree, in order to equalize overall saturation of colors in the photo, and then tone down the, the saturation, rather, tone down that saturation to make the image look that much better. So I've boosted the colors, I've equalized the colors with vibrance, and then toned things down just a little bit using saturation. So a positive value for vibrance combined with the negative value for saturation can be really helpful in a variety of situations. Associated with vibrance and saturation amongst these presence controls, we find clarity, another favorite. So we'll switch to another image here. Clarity is essentially, you can think of clarity as being very similar to sharpening, but it's sharpening that's happening across a larger distance of pixels, if you will. In other words, it's really more of a mid-tone contrast enhancement, a rather sophisticated and very helpful mid-tone contrast enhancement. So I can take the details in a photo and really enhance them, really make those details stand out. So why was I photographing cabbage in South Korea I don't know, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. 
Uh, in large part, what captured my attention here, certainly the color to some extent, but really it was this very interesting texture, the play of light and shadow on a, let's call it a larger level, the shadows in the background versus the highlights, the lighting, soft lighting on the cabbage themselves, but then also the somewhat intricate detail of the leaves of the cabbage. We've got nice texture in there, and so I want to enhance that texture, and clarity helps me accomplish exactly that. So for me personally, I usually like having a pretty good amount of texture. I like to enhance textures in my photos, so I like a healthy dose of clarity for many images. But you might also find some situations where you want a negative value for clarity. This can soften up, soften up portraits, for example, help to make flowers look a little bit more kind of delicate and romantic, help make a scene look more ethereal, more painterly. It can be very interesting for a variety of subjects. So part of that, again, depends on the image as well as your personal preferences as a photographer. I would say do be careful not to overdo things. It, you can Because the clarity adjustment doesn't create halos, for example, the way we see with sharpening, you might feel that you can get away with more clarity than an image really deserves. And the image starts to look what I call a little bit crunchy, and that's not always a good thing. So a little self-control certainly can be a good idea when it comes to clarity, but that's it. It won't create halos the way we see with sharpening effects, and so in many cases you can actually push that clarity pretty far and end up with a very, very good result. And again, it can reduce the overall appearance of kind of a hazy look to an image, but more importantly, it really can help make the details, fine details, stand out. But speaking of clarity and speaking of haze, when it comes to hazy scenes, there's another adjustment. Now this is a newer adjustment and it's only available in the Creative Cloud version of Lightroom. Uh, it's also available in Adobe Camera Raw, so if you have Photoshop, but of course the latest version of Photoshop as well as the latest Creative Cloud version of Lightroom both require a Creative Cloud subscription from Adobe. So to get DAs, you will need a Creative Cloud subscription, so do be aware of that. I do wish that the DHAZE slider was right here next to Clarity because to me it's a very similar adjustment. Instead, Adobe decided to put it way, way, way down here in effects. So we'll go to DHAZE. I can use a negative value, much as we saw with Clarity. I can use a negative value, not exactly an ethereal look, more just a foggy or smoky look when we use a negative value for DHAZE. Generally speaking, you'll want to reduce haze so you'll increase to a positive value. So let's take that back down to zero and then increase the value and you'll see we're able to dramatically reduce the appearance of haze in the image. Now I do find that a strong dehaze adjustment has a tendency to bring out a lot more of the shadow color, which is typically going to be the more blue values. And so once I've applied a dehaze adjustment, I'll very often need to go back up into the image and shift toward a more warm value. So take that temperature slider over toward the right and the basic set of adjustments in order to warm up to lose that issue in the shadows. I might also boost the overall colors. I could still apply a little bit of a clarity adjustment, but that's a pretty dramatic change. And that brings us to one other little trick that can be very helpful for evaluating your images. Similar and basic concept to the notion of an undo, but the before and after view, if you press the backslash key on the keyboard, while you're in the develop module, then you'll see the before version of the image. You can see an indication of that up at the top right of the preview for my image, an indication that this is the before view, and then backslash again, and I'm back to the after view. So there's a pretty dramatic change in which you would never know it had been a hazy day atop Steptoe Butte out in the Palouse region of eastern Washington. So dehaze, very helpful. You might even say, I know some photographers have resisted going to the Creative Cloud subscription plan, but dehaze, along with guided upright, might be reason enough to, to make that switch, which I know is exactly what Adobe is counting on, tempting us with some rather cool, rather helpful adjustments that are only available as part of the Creative Cloud plan. So every now and then, I do have some issues. Well, speaking of the Palouse, this photograph was captured in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. We were just out there in June leading a series of field photography workshops. I lost count of how many times I had to clean my image sensor because of all the dust out there. And so sensor dust can really be an issue. I have an image here that demonstrates, not from the Palouse, but that demonstrates 
some dust in the image. And if we take a look here, we can probably spot, well, let's see, one, two, three. Oh, it looks about four, perhaps four dust spots on that image sensor that need to be cleaned. Not only on the sensor, of course, but also for the image. And that's where we have the spot removal tool. So I've gone through what I consider my most important basic adjustments, not just the basic section, but some of the other adjustments that are helpful in certain situations, such as dehaze. But then I'm ready to start thinking about, okay, this image is looking really good. I'm pretty happy with the overall image. So now how do I get rid of my other issues, in this case, dust or noise, etc. So let's take a look at dust spots. In this case, you can see I have some very simple dust spots, not going to be a problem to get rid of those at all, because I very carefully selected an image where the dust spots were all out in the open sky. So it's going to be very, very, very easy for Lightroom to fix those dust spots. But Lightroom does not include the more advanced technology in terms of being able to clean up blemishes in your photos. And so I would say that for most what I would call real image cleanup work, more sophisticated image cleanup work, I still need to send the image over to Photoshop. But for basic spotting work, Lightroom does a pretty good job. So I'll go ahead and choose that spot removal tool. I want the brush to be set to heal. I would say pretty much without exception, I want to blend my cleanup into the surrounding area. The size I won't worry about, I'll adjust that on the fly. Feathering I leave at zero because that heal option is going to cause blending to happen automatically. And opacity at 100% because I want to get rid of the dust spots altogether, not just tone them down. So then I can bring my mouse out into the image and I'll adjust the size of the brush using the left and right square bracket keys. So the left square bracket key to reduce the size of the brush and then the right square bracket key to increase the size of the brush. Now, generally what I want is for my brush size to be just a little bigger than the spot that I'm getting rid of, essentially right about the exact same size as that spot. And then I can simply click on that spot, click on the other spot. I could even, in this case, my spots are all round, but if need be, I'll go ahead and just paint a streak here. I could paint a shape to get rid of a different shape spot if need be. In this case, that was not the shape I really needed, but I could paint along if I had a little you know, fur on my sensor or somehow a little fiber, I could paint along the shape of that fiber in order to remove that from the image. Notice that the source and destination are indicated and the shape of each, of course, match each other. In this case, I don't need that spot cleanup, so I'll just press the delete key on the keyboard to get rid of that dust spot, well, to get rid of the spot removal. And then I'll go ahead and click on that other dust spot and that other dust spot. And I think we're all finished. I think I've gotten rid of all of the spots in this image. But I think if you look closely, you might see some other spots in the image that are not quite as easy to see. But I can make those spots a lot easier to see using the Visualize Spots checkbox on the toolbar down below the image preview. I'll turn on and oh my goodness, look at these little circles, apparently some water droplets that were on my image sensor. Those are some spots I was not seeing with the normal view of the image, but fortunately, Visualize Spots makes it much, much easier for me to see all those spots. And in fact, I can click on each of those dust spots while I'm still in the Visualize Spots display in order to clean up those seemingly countless spots. I also have a slider so I can change the overall appearance. You can see this is sort of like a find edges type of a filter effect. In most cases, I find that I'm able to see the spots the best when the slider is all the way over toward the right. But I do recommend sliding through the full range just because some spots will be easier to see at different settings. I'll turn that off and you can see when I hover over the mouse, I have my tool overlay on the toolbar set to auto so that when my mouse is over the image, I can see all of those spots. My goodness, I thought there were only four, and look at all of those. And then when I move my mouse away from the image, I see the actual image itself without all those spots on it. So probably still a few more spots to clean up there, but you get the idea. Pretty easy to use that spot removal tool inside of Lightroom, but again, really just for the more basic cleanup work. I'll go ahead and click Close to close the set of adjustments related to that spot removal tool. And then before we run out of time, I know we've got some questions queuing up, and so we'll get to those questions shortly. Um, but I want to talk about a couple of other techniques as well. 
And let's see, so I, the, I see there was a question. Uh, Renee, there's a question about the uh, spot removal tool. Yes, uh, Susan asked, which menu are you using to identify the spots for the spot removal tool? Uh, yeah, so when we're in the spot removal tool, down here on the toolbar, now if you don't have your toolbar visible, you can just press the letter T on the keyboard to see the toolbar. Once we've already selected the spot removal tool, I can then turn on visualize spots and adjust that slider. So that makes it much easier to be able to see the actual spots in the image. And I do use a combination going back and forth, looking visually in the image and then also using that visualize spots to help. And then being sure to confirm that what looks like a spot in visualize spots with that preview that it really is a spot that I want to remove. It's not always. Just because it looks like a dust spot when you've turned on that option doesn't mean that it really is something you want to get rid of. Maybe it's just some texture that gets lit up a little bit when you use that visualize spot option. So we have another question from Kathy. If I do not have Creative Cloud, is there a close preset that you can recommend for DH? Ah, yes, a little trick, a little workaround. I wonder how much longer this workaround will exist. But if you do not have the Creative Cloud version of Lightroom, you might have found that there are presets available out there that enable the dehaze feature. At some point, I imagine Adobe will find a way to make this no longer work. But if you have someone who's using the Creative Cloud version of Lightroom, create a series of presets for you that include the dehaze adjustment at you know 20% increments, for example, if you load those presets into the non-Creative Cloud version of Lightroom, into Lightroom 6, you'll have access to dehaze, even though you don't have a dehaze slider, by virtue of being able to use those presets to apply the, pre the dehaze in the specific increments, 20, 40, 60, and 80, for example. Uh, so that is a little workaround that some photographers have discovered and that are using. I imagine Adobe might fix that little uh, workaround capability at some point. All right, so we talked about the color in the image and some cleanup. Let's look at a couple of basics in terms of uh, more creative, you might say, adjustments for an image. And so in this case, creating a black and white interpretation. Now I mentioned that we do not want to create a black and white interpretation by just desaturating, by setting our saturation down to minus 100. Instead, I want to exercise a bit more control over that process, over the creative process of interpreting the black and white image. And so in this case, what I do is go to the treatment section, uh, the treatment option underneath the basic section. I have color versus black and white. Or I can just come down to the HSL color B and W, or black and white section, and click the B and W, the black and white. So either option. They're essentially two ways of accessing the exact same features. So choose black and white under treatment or B and W under the HSL section, and that converts the image. You can see I have a black and white interpretation of the image, but more importantly, I have the ability to adjust luminance values or brightness values based on the original color within the photo. So if there were some blues in that image, I could brighten the blues or darken the blues. So you see I have some areas of the photo that were blue, uh, let's see, do I have any yellows? Some yellows are in there. There were so many colors, but I've forgotten which things were which color in the original photo. So that makes it a little bit challenging to try to make a decision. In other situations, it would be a lot easier. I can brighten up the blues to brighten up the sky or darken up the greens and the yellows to darken up the foliage or whatever it is that I want to do to the image. But fortunately, for those situations where you're not really sure what color various things are, you can work directly on the image. This same basic adjustment that I'm going to show you is available for a variety of different adjustments. I'm just going to demonstrate it for black and white, but the same concept applies. This direct adjustment or on-image adjustment. If I click on this icon, it looks like a little target that lights it up, and so now I can go into the image. Notice that my mouse pointer has that icon associated with it. I can point to an area of the image. I'm pointing at a dark roof here, and if you take a look over on the right panel, the blue value has been highlighted. So that tells me if I want to adjust the luminosity, the brightness of this area, of this roof, it's the blue slider that I want to work with. 
but I don't even have to touch the blue slider. While I'm in the image itself, I can point to an area that represents something that I want to adjust to brighten or darken, and then click on that area and drag upward to brighten and downward to darken. So you can see that the blue, and in this case, the purple sliders, because where I click, it's got a little bit of both blue and purple to it. Both of those sliders are being adjusted. So I can come out into the image. Here's an orange area, for example. I can lighten or darken the oranges, and I can move around the image and find various color values from the original image. So here's a red area, for example, and I can lighten or darken the reds that are found in the image. So I can work directly on the image to adjust the overall look. Which color values from the original are going to be interpreted at which particular luminance or brightness values? Now, one of the things I think it's really important to keep in mind when it comes to converting to a black and white interpretation of a photo, there's a good chance that I might have already worked with the overall tonal adjustments with the color version. Now I've converted to black and white and I adjust the luminosity for individual channels but let's not forget to go back and revisit our basic adjustments because now we're dealing with just luminance values as opposed to luminance for a color image. And so our target values might change for the whites, blacks, highlights, and shadows, for example. So we come back to whites, and sure enough, I need to brighten those whites a little bit more than they were already set. I want to bring the blacks up just a little bit more as well. Maybe I'll darken up those shadows just a little bit pull down the highlights of hair, and so you can see I want to revisit those adjustments when it comes to interpreting that black and white version of the image. So convert to black and white, exercise control over that process, but then be sure to revisit all of your other adjustments to make sure that they are optimized as well. I also want to address virtual copies. Now that we've gotten into a little bit more creative interpretation, you might find that there are situations where you want to take a creative approach, but you want a different version of the image. So in this case, for example, maybe I want to have a color version of the image, but I also want to have a black and white interpretation of that photo. So I can go through and apply my various adjustments for the color version, and then create a virtual copy and produce a black and white interpretation of the image as well. To do that, I'll simply right click on the image. So click with the right mouse button, Macintosh users, if you're still using one of those old-fashioned one-button mice, you can hold the control key on the keyboard and click. But I'll right-click and then choose Create Virtual Copy. That will make an additional copy. Notice that I've got this little turned corner icon down at the bottom left of that virtual copy. And if I hover over, you'll see below the preview area, you might see the indication. Right over here, you'll see Copy 1, indicating that this is a virtual copy. Now, initially, that virtual copy inherits the settings for the original. So right now, the, the exact same adjustments are applied to this version of the image. But I could then go and choose, for example, a black and white interpretation of the photo. Maybe I want to brighten up the foliage here, and perhaps darken down the sky just a little bit, maybe take clarity up a little bit further. You get the idea I'm able to interpret the black and white version separate from the color version of the photo. So now I have two interpretations of the same image. I could even take things a little bit further. A little bonus lesson, if I want to apply split toning, a lot of photographers take a look at split toning and figure out it's not for them. That's because you can create some really odd effect very quickly. Things start to look a little bit weird, or you might say retro. Maybe a, you can think of a film stock or an old process that this might look like. But generally speaking, what I would say is that I tend to use a single value. So I would shift to the balance to a plus value and only work with the highlights, go find a color that I like, and perhaps the most important tip of all is to reduce the saturation significantly. So we need to start with saturation turned up, see the color, but then I want to take that saturation way, way down. My general preference when it comes to creating a color tint like this is that initially I almost want to feel like, oh, I've taken the color away completely then I turn off split toning and bring it back, and I can see that color making its appearance. I might even want to turn this down a little bit further. So generally speaking, with this type of effect, I would say that less is more. So, Renee, do we have more questions from some of our attendees today? Yeah, we have a couple more questions. Um, George asked earlier on in the webinar, 
Lightroom, Photoshop, Nick on one. Do we need <laughs> them all? So Tim, what's your advice for that? Do we need absolutely every software tool ever pitched to photographers? Obviously the answer is no, not at all. Uh, first off, let's talk about Lightroom versus Photoshop. I would say that with each new release of Lightroom, I have less need for Photoshop. That's not to say I don't use Photoshop. I use it for image cleanup, as I mentioned. I'll use it for some more sophisticated, targeted adjustments using layer masking for some other creative effects. But in terms of my more typical images, most of my images, most of the time, only need Lightroom in terms of my overall general adjustments. Photoshop is more for those kind of more sophisticated adjustments, more sophisticated creative techniques. And then there's a wide variety of plugins available. And I would say it's tricky to say which ones you might need. Some photographers might need none of them. Um, when it comes to HDR, for example, my tool of choice is Nick HDR Effects Pro, which is part of the Google collection, which, uh, well, the Nick collection, I should say, from Google. And it's actually completely free now. And so that's an option you might look at for HDR. For Silver Effects Pro for black and white, also very good. On One has done a tremendous job more recently of creating some very sophisticated plugins and even standalone software. Alien Skin has got some good stuff. Topaz, the list goes on and on. In a lot of cases, you'll find there's lots of overlap in terms of what those plugins do. But also, you'll find in many cases that you could have accomplished the same thing in Lightroom or Photoshop if you took the time. So I think of those plugins as providing a few benefits. Number one is a potential workflow benefit in terms of efficiency of your workflow, helping you get to a particular result more quickly. They also provide a bit of creative inspiration. So they'll help you realize results for your images that you might not have even thought to do, if not for all of the previews that are given to you in those various plugins. And so there are certainly some benefits. I think the most important thing to consider is that I think for every plugin that's available out there, there's a free trial version that you can download and play around with. So take a look at reviews, take a look at articles, keep in mind that you know different photographers are going to have different perspectives on which is the right tool. So don't take an article as the absolute truth for your specific workflow, but use the various reviews and articles as a guide in terms of which particular plugins you might want to take a look at and then download the free trial and try them out and see how they work for you. I do want to real quickly go through a workflow for an image here. This is an image as it came right out of the camera. And one of the things I want to underscore is that in many cases, it doesn't take much to produce a good effect in the image, to produce an effect that you're happy with in the image. And so just by way of example, here's a photo that I'm pretty happy with out of the camera, but I think can look a little bit better. So holding the alter option key, setting my white point, in this case, brightening up pretty significantly on those whites. The black point doesn't need, doesn't need quite as strong an adjustment, but still relatively strong because it was a somewhat flat scene. Maybe just a little hint of clarity, and I might shift that color just a smidge. The color overall was a little too warm to my eye. Maybe right about there. Darken down the highlights just a little bit in order to accentuate the texture. And that's about it. That's about everything I need for that image. There's my before versus after. You know, really not much of an overall change. And just underscoring that the workflow, the process can be very simple in terms of getting started with your basic adjustments, getting more comfortable with Lightroom, and learning to really optimize the appearance of your photos. So I encourage you, you know, take the lessons that you've learned today in terms of the basics of getting started with Lightroom and practice, play around. Remember, remember those virtual copies. The virtual copy is a separate version of your image. You can think of it as a play version, something just to have fun with. Remember, Lightroom is always non-destructive in any event, but with a virtual copy, now you can really just go absolutely bonkers, having all sorts of fun applying different adjustments, experimenting with your adjustments for the image, feeling completely comfortable that you're just getting familiar and you're not doing any harm to your photos at all. Renee. Quest. Yes. Um, question related to metadata conflicts. Sure. How do you know what is in conflict and which is right or most recent? Rick asks. Yeah, so if there's a metadata conflict that's going to be indicated in the library module, it could relate to both a, a develop adjustment, because remember, all of our adjustments in the develop module are metadata, 
or it could relate to something like keywords or star ratings. And what that means is that you did something outside of Lightroom, generally speaking. Now the question is, which of the versions of metadata is the right version, the correct version? And that's, that depends on what you did to change the metadata in two different places. In the context of adjustments in the develop module, if there's a conflict in metadata that relates to your develop adjustments, that probably means that you opened the original raw capture directly inside of Photoshop instead of sending your image from Lightroom to Photoshop. So one of the big rules of Lightroom is that you want to make sure that everything you do with your images starts inside of Lightroom. And in fact, to help you better understand how Lightroom works, we're going to give you a video course to thank you for attending today. And so as a reminder, we do have another webinar on Friday that you might want to attend that's focused once again on optimizing photos, but focused a little more on your intent for the image. As a person, a photographer who registered for this webinar, check your email inbox a little bit later today. We're going to send you instructions on how to access a video course called Understanding Lightroom for free. You'll be able to access the entire course through the Gray Learning Library, mostly aimed at helping you better get a better understanding of how Lightroom works so that you can avoid some of the common mistakes in Lightroom. And in the process, you'll get to know the Gray Learning Video Training Library, and hopefully you'll decide that that library is right for you and you'll want to sign up to access all of the video training courses there. And so if you just can't wait to get started learning more, we do have a special discount. We will send info on this via email, but if you want to make a note of the website address, timgray.me slash PSA bundle 99 and that will get you a discounted rate on the Gray Learning Everything Bundle that includes all of my video training courses, the monthly issues of Fixology Magazine, monthly issues of the Ask Tim Gray Digest, and a whole lot more. So you can check that out. But more importantly, in the short term, check your email inbox a little later today. We'll send you instructions on how you can access the free course, Understanding Lightroom. Just be sure. The course itself is actually not free. We're providing it to you for free. So there is a specific link that you'll need to follow in order to take advantage, to get that course for free. So check your email inbox for that. And Renee, we have another question? Yes. How do you install a plugin like Nick? Uh, good question. So the various plugins that are available, so the Nick collection from Google, for example, so that you can get Silver FX Pro and HDR FX Pro, those get installed, you download the software from the provider, so in the case of Nick from the Google website, uh, google.com slash Nick Collection, and then you can download and install the software, and most of these tools will give you an option during the installation process of which plugins. It'll either just do it automatically, or it'll give you an option that the software, in most cases, will be installed as a plugin for Photoshop, for Lightroom, sometimes for Photoshop Elements, depending on the specific plugin, sometimes for other software tools as well. And in some cases, though, what we refer to as plugins, these third-party software solutions, can also run as scan software. So a plugin typically means that we send images from Lightroom or from Photoshop to this plugin. But in many cases, you actually can open an image directly within the software. But again, in the case of Lightroom, we want to make sure that we are starting everything. One of the core principles of Lightroom is that once you're using Lightroom to manage your photos, everything needs to start inside of Lightroom so that you won't have mismanagement, you won't get images that are lost, and you won't have confusing issues such as that metadata mismatch that was referred to in a previous question. And so understanding how Lightroom works can be tremendously helpful in that regard. So in the case of Lightroom, when it comes to using plugins, you absolutely positively want to make sure that you're sending the image from Lightroom to that plugin directly. Okay. Are there any plugins for functions like Dodge and Burn in Photoshop for Lightroom? Uh, so there are some plugins that are available that give you those sorts of capabilities. So, for example, On One Software has some targeted adjustment capabilities. And we also have, in the various tools in the NIC collection, we have, uh, they have what they refer to as control points that are similar in terms of being able to, for example, lighten and darken specific areas. But we can actually apply dodging and burning directly inside of Lightroom as well. We do have an adjustment brush. I'll just perform some, well, 
we'll do some very silly dodging and burning here for just a moment. So if, for example, I create a new adjustment brush adjustment, I'll just apply an exposure adjustment of minus one stop. So now I'm able to darken specific areas of the image, obviously doing a silly job of it here, but just to illustrate the concept. And then I can create a new area that I want to adjust, in this case, a positive value for exposure, and I can go brighten up other areas of the image. So obviously in this case, a far too strong effect, and also I haven't feathered the brush enough, etc. But the idea being is that we can apply those targeted adjustments using the adjustment brush inside of Lightroom as well. So there are some plugins that would help with some of that. Certainly you could send images over to Photoshop, but as you can see with the adjustment brush inside of Lightroom, we have that same basic capability in terms of being able to dodge and burn, lightening and darkening specific areas using a brush to paint with light and dark into those areas. Okay, we have one last question. One last question, yes. This is from Chris. He was in the Joshua Tree last week at night shooting uh -huh. the Milky Way. So what are what techniques can you recommend in Lightroom to bring out the wonders of the Milky Way? The wonders of the Milky Way. So a few things. The exposure adjustment, I don't have an image here to demonstrate uh, that capability. Uh, I don't have a night shot handy on in the side of this Lightroom catalog. But there's a few things there. Number one, setting your exposure, setting the white point very carefully, and possibly increasing exposure being careful about the white point, and then we want more contrast, so darkening up some of those shadows. Vibrance is going to help tremendously in terms of bringing out the colors can be very, very subtle, and then an incredibly careful application of noise reduction. Uh, for night photo, especially longer exposure, you're going to tend to have a fair amount of noise, and especially if you're out for a while taking lots of pictures, build up in the camera, and you get even more noise. Lightroom does an exceptionally good job of noise reduction, and so being very, very careful. Uh, I'll show you just real quickly here, scroll down and take a look at the controls. One of the most important things, I, I would say for any night photo, you're probably under noise reduction going to want that smoothness value all, all the way up at its maximum. Zoom in and take a look at the color. Now, we need to be careful that we're not removing stars, for example, treating them as noise. So we want to focus our attention on the color noise and pay careful attention to the specific value that we're using. We're gonna need a fairly strong dose of noise reduction with most of those night photos. You know, you're typically, well, for a Milky Way shot, assuming no star trails, you're probably photographing at, you know, somewhere around a 15 second exposure, give or take. So that's gonna to lead to some noise all by itself. And if you've been out for a while capturing lots of long exposures, heat buildup can add to noise as well. And so certainly noise reduction is gonna be a key factor, but just that overall contrast, darken up the shadows a little bit, Adjust the exposure, make sure your white point is set well, and clarity can help a little bit as well, and vibrance to bring out some of those more subtle colors that you're going to find uh, within that Milky Way display as well. So, Lots of fun, certainly. Photographing at night can be a lot of fun, especially when it's not too cold out, <laughs> and, and then optimizing those images. We do have a course on optimizing night photos that's not exactly aimed at astral photography, but that is in the Gray Learning Video Training Library, so you might take a look at that. But once again, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you to PSA for hosting the webinar today. Uh, do check your email inbox so that you can find out how to access that free course on understanding Lightroom so that you'll have a better idea of how to use Lightroom and so you'll avoid many of the more common mistakes so that you hopefully will not need what has become my far and away most popular video course ever cleaning up your mess in Lightroom. So I hope you'll never need that course. Understanding Lightroom can certainly help, and that course will be yours free just for joining the webinar today. So thank you very much. And once again, if you've enjoyed the webinar and you're eager to get started with more of the video training that is available through the Gray Learning Video Training Library, by all means, you can get that immediately at a discounted price just by going in your web browser to timgray.me slash PSA Bundle 99. So once again, thanks very much for joining us, and we'll hope to see you on a future webinar. Thanks, Jim.